Last night might have been one of the most uneventful NXT TV tapings that we've seen in a very long time, man. I'm not saying that it was a bad show last night from Full Sail. I'm just saying that WWE clearly was setting aside some of the minor things that they had left over from this particular set of tapings, and then we're moving on. We're moving on to the last four weeks right before TakeOver Brooklyn number four. And WWE, they can fucking kiss my ass for sending out a notification. And I guess it's my fault. I guess it's all my fault, and I guess it's all your guys' fault as well. If you don't take notifications off the goddamn fucking app. Like, I don't have them on my iPhone, but on my iPad, when I wake up this morning, and I look at my iPad, and I'm getting ready to do YouTube-related business and answer emails... Major title change at last night's NXT TV tapings. What the fuck is it going to be? What is it going to be? So, WWE, prematurely as always, spoiled something that probably is one of the best things that you'll see on WWE television, period, all year. I will not say what's going on. I refuse to look at the fucking spoilers. I refuse to look at anything. I kind of have a good idea of where WWE is going with NXT into TakeOver. Outside of the main event, which is up in the air, and everybody's got their fantasy booking situation, you can kind of tell where WWE is going with most of their big matches for TakeOver. And the way I see it, TakeOver Brooklyn, Triple H once upon a time stated that this, this weekend, SummerSlam weekend for NXT is there. WrestleMania. So, depending on how you view it or not, NXT TakeOver New Orleans this year, not really considered NXT's biggest show of the year. This is indeed their biggest show of the year. And it's going to be very difficult for WWE to top what they did in New Orleans. But if there's anybody that I have faith in doing that, it's Triple H because he is of the mentality like me. If it's not better than the last time we went out there, then we failed. So you know Triple H is going to deliver the best takeover he possibly can. And with the supporting cast of players that we have front and center with Gargano, Black, Champa, and then Ricochet, Adam Cole, you guys know what's going on, man. This is a show that is not going to disappoint. So what WWE did last night is set you up for the women's championship match at TakeOver. Which again was very predictable, but it's something that makes sense. And there's a prior history with these two females. I'm talking about Kyrie Sane and Shayna Baszler. Kyrie Sane and Shayna Baszler. The final two in the Mae Young Classic for 2017. Both women, you know, into a WWE environment, very new. Kyrie Sane, we all knew. From her career over in Japan, I wasn't too familiar with what she did over there. I think one of the few times I seen her was when she was a part of the Black Lotus tribe in Lucha Underground. And she went against Pentagon Dark in a three-on-one gauntlet match with Pentagon. Uh, it was her. I don't, I don't remember who the other woman was. If you guys want to leave it down in the comments, by all means do so. And then it was uh, Ayo Shirai, right? So I, I watched that back, actually... And my God, man, if they only showed that type of physicality here in the WWE, you know, but that's Lucha Underground, that's another beast. But Kyrie Sane coming into the Mae Young Classic, everybody kind of figured she was going to be the odds on favorite to win it. You know, you had your, your other favorites in there like Tony Storm and Shannon Baszler was clearly a favorite being that she had the UFC MMA background with Ronda Rousey and the UFC Four Horsewomen. Uh, Tony Storm was one of my favorites in that tournament. Bianca Belair was in there. You had Santana Garrett in there. Uh, Piper Niven, Viper was in there. You know, a lot of good women in that tournament. So Tessa Blanchard was always uh, was was also in there. She actually brought Kyrie Sane to one of the best matches in that tournament. As did Bianca Belair. I actually liked the Bianca Belair match better than I did the Tessa Blanchard match, uh, which is unreal. How you know even Brian Gulish said, "How, how the fuck are you going to let Tessa Blanchard go?" to Impact Wrestling and not sign her to a WWE uh, developmental deal for NXT. I don't understand that. But Impact got a steal with that. 
Uh, but back to Kyrie Sane and Shayna Baszler, man. Both women have definitely grown since that Mae Young Classic. And to see this match happen again a year later, this was the money match. This was the money match. Yes, I believe in a Candice LeRae to bring a great match out of Shayna Baszler. She's got that underdog mentality. She's got that Johnny Gargano-esque feel to her. She's great at what she does. She's athletic. She's got a great look. And then you got Nikki Cross. So we can automatically exclude Nikki Cross from the conversation. She's either being called up imminently to the main roster or is just going to be a supporting player in NXT without really having a title reign. She is that one person to add validity to a match. And that's what her role was in last night's show. She wasn't going to win. She was just there for name value to hype the match as somebody credible, but was nowhere near a championship match. Now, Candice LeRae had a little back and forth with Shayna Baszler just a week ago. Slapped Shayna Baszler right in the face. Uh, they've been building her up nicely and slow. And, and then Kyrie Sane has been going back and forth with Lacey Evans. Kyrie Sane cut that promo last week that she's coming for the treasure. She wants the NXT Championship. That she has one win over Shayna Baszler. As does Shayna Baszler over Kyrie Sane. It is 1-1. So, back during the winter, Shayna Baszler did beat Kyrie Sane in a one-on-one -on -one match on NXT television. So, Moro Ronaldo even did mention that on commentary. It is a 1-1 one -one tie. This is going to be the tiebreaker match at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. Just based on where Shayna Baszler has come from in the last year, I am incredibly excited to see what she can do with Kyrie Sane now and make it an even better match than what we got in the Mae Young Classic final. Kyrie Sane has not, and I don't mean this in a negative way. I don't mean this... As far as I don't like what she does, because I really do. I think she's great. But Kyrie Sane really has not proven to me anything yet in the WWE. She really hasn't been a standout talent. I honestly think others have flown by her as far as must-see or stand out. Shayna Baszler being one of them. Bianca Belair being another. Candice LeRae breathing right down her neck as well. You know, um... Kyrie Sane right now kind of lost in the shuffle. She needs that one big takeover match. And I was thinking that with Kyrie Sane coming into the WWE, she was going to be the replacement for Asuka. They were going to build her up as the next successor to Asuka. And that has not worked out. But there's no doubt in my mind that this is going to be Kyrie Sane's first big NXT championship match, first big takeover match outside of what she's already done. Uh, with a championship opportunity. I believe she won the Mae Young Classic and was placed in a fatal four-way. That really didn't do much of anything. WWE didn't give her the championship, and rightfully so. You're not going to put the championship on her immediately after winning the Mae Young Classic. It would have been way too predictable. WWE waiting for this opportunity, possibly to get the championship on her and then build a division around her. And it looks like, so far, so good for my prediction. Kyrie Sane won that triple threat match last night. She's going on to Brooklyn to fight Shayna Baszler. And Bianca Belair was noticeably absent from the discussion last night. Now, the week, uh, the week prior, a week ago, they hyped this up as a fatal four-way match. Bianca Belair, during the time of these tapings, was on her honeymoon with Montez Ford of the Street Profits. She got married, honeymoon, all that stuff. Congratulations to them. WWE played it off as, as if Bianca Belair was not medically cleared. They had Moro Ronaldo dub in with a little voiceover, and they changed it from a Fatal 4-Way to a Triple Threat match, stating that Bianca Belair was not medically cleared to compete in this Fatal 4-Way, and it is now a Triple Threat match. Bianca Belair is not hurt. Bianca Belair is probably going to come back and say, you know, I was not medically cleared to compete in a championship number one contenders match, and I want what is rightfully mine. They took it from me. I was good to go. They told me I couldn't, wor uh, I couldn't work and I couldn't wrestle. I want my opportunity. I worked so hard to get here. I am the only woman on this roster that is undefeated. I want my shot. And I honestly think with step by step, what I predicted is happening. Kyrie Sane is going to beat Shayna Baszler for the Women's Championship. It's time. It's time. Shayna Baszler, right now, is at the top of her game. There's no female champion, and you probably could say there's no female right now that's doing better work than Shayna Baszler in all of the WWE. You look at Alexa Bliss 
and you look at Carmella, and then you look at Shayna Baszler as your women's champions in this company. It's fucking laughable. It is absolutely laughable. Shayna Baszler embodies everything that a women's champion should be. She's got a great look. She's, she's a great promo. She's come a long way in that department. She's still rough around the edges in the ring, but you, you see that she is getting better. Shayna Baszler tells a great story in the ring, and that's why I'm excited for the match with Kyrie Sane. You know, Kyrie Sane, we all know, can tell a great story. She could take a beating. She's got that Johnny Gargano, Bret Hart effect where she takes a beating and we feel bad for her. She, she, you know, she's mounting a comeback and we're all on her side. We want to see her make a big comeback. That's the Kyrie Sane effect. So I think this is going to play perfectly into Brooklyn and the championship match and show you how far these women have come just from a year ago. But if you look at Shayna Baszler, man, right now there's nobody doing better as far as a female goes, in the WWE. It's downright laughable, you know? And, and I poke fun at it on social media. Shayna Baszler is better than Alexa Bliss in every single category. That's what you want out of a women's champion. She's great, and I can't wait to see what she does against Kyrie Sane. Kyrie Sane is the number one contender for the NXT Women's Championship, and it's going to be a damn good match. And that was the first match, actually, announced for Brooklyn number 4 Summer Slam Weekend. I don't know what they're doing with Cassius Ono, but obviously he's going to be in some sort of storyline. Now, some of you guys actually tweeted me saying that you're interested to see if Cassius Ono turns heel. I I didn't get that vibe yet, but everything in NXT that you see on TV is done for a reason. So if Cassius Ono beat Rick Ramirez in less than 10 seconds with a rolling elbow, obviously something's going on with Cassius Ono. I don't know what it is, but I feel Cassius Ono is suffering from the wrong place at the wrong time syndrome. You know, they brought him back and he's been nothing more than a helping hand, a backstage player, a, I guess, a six stringer. You know, you want any more analogies? He's just that helping hand that's going to be a well-known named enhancement talent. But everything that you see on NXT TV is done for a reason. So if he's beating somebody in 10 seconds with one move when we know he could probably out-wrestle half that fucking roster, you better believe that they got something planned for Cassius Ono. I don't know what it is, but I doubt it's going to be a heel turn. Maybe a heel turn is necessary to kind of take Cassius Ono from this stagnant place where he is right now and move him to that next level. I don't know. But we've seen Cassius Ono beat Rick Ramirez in uh, almost 10 seconds flat. There was a great inside story on the War Raiders. Now, obviously, I don't watch Ring of Honor. Uh, I watch very little New Japan. I only watch when people are going out of their minds crazy for it. Though I should start watching it. I just don't have enough time because this takes up the majority of my time. But the War Raiders inside story last night was very, very well done. You know, a lot of people right now are not really feeling the War Raiders is what the vibe I get. Even though they got a great look, I love their theme. It's very simple. It's very catchy. It's, you know, a a huge War Raider chant that could go very well in, in the big segments of a match or, you know, when they win a championship or I love their entrance. They, they just got a great look and a great vibe to them. I didn't know their backstory. I didn't know the War Raiders' backstory. So when WWE started showing clips from Ring of Honor, New Japan, and you know, ICW, Progress, uh, they really stood out as likable characters. And this is what should be done on the main roster. I don't know why this isn't being done for some of the guys that are called up to the main roster and are going to have a bunch of new eyes on them. They throw these guys out there with the expectation of Yeah, these guys are former NXT Tag Team Champions. You're supposed to like these guys, and it's up to you and your job to go out of your way and find what these guys are about. Meanwhile, you got the War Raiders here. I like them even more so now after this five-minute story that they told. It was a great story. Why didn't they do that with AOP when they made their main roster debut? I I don't understand that. Why didn't they do that with Bobby Roode when he made his main roster debut? Why didn't they do that with Tyler Breeze? When he made his main roster debut. Why didn't they do that with Ember Moon? It's like WWE just takes and then they, they put on Raw and SmackDown and they don't care. Why didn't they do that with Almas all these months? He's just being wasted. Give me a backstory on the guy. 
give me a reason to care about him. I care about him because I've seen the body of work that he did in NXT. But to the casual clown, nobody knows who Almas is. Nobody knows where he came from. Nobody knows why he's so great or what he's doing in the WWE. The War Raiders thing got them over as a team. Now you're going to be more interested to know about them, find out about them, and when they wrestle again, you're going to be even more into what they do. They're eventually going to be number one contenders for the tag team titles. And when that moment comes, you're going to reflect back on this story and you're going to realize that, you know, these guys are the real deal. Hanson and Rowe talk about their past and how they were uh, brought together. They actually went one-on-one and they decided, listen, we beat the shit out of each other. Imagine what we could do to others if we did this to one another. They ended up destroying each other and decided maybe it was a better idea to team together and bring that destruction towards tag team wrestling. So we see a bunch of clips from from their indie days. Like I said, ICW, Progress, Ring of Honor, New Japan, in Mexico. They became modern-day Vikings. Rowe says that no one on earth can stop them, but Rowe got in a motorcycle accident in 2014, which I didn't know. So this type of personal shit is exactly what I want to hear. In 2014... uh, he got in a motorcycle wreck, and that could have ended his life. He should. He said he should have been dead. They completely reworked his arm, and since then, he's had no fear since that wasn't able to take him out. Hansen says that they look one way, but they fight like another. Roe is the smaller of the two, but fights like a big guy, while Hansen is the one who can fly. This was a very good promo. If you guys are not sold on the War Raiders, I recommend you guys go and watch what they put on the WWE YouTube channel. It's called the Inside Story of War Raiders World Domination from NXT TV last night. The Velveteen Dream goes over his entire progress. Every single takeover, he goes over what he did. He sets the mood. He's backstage. All of a sudden, you see him snap his fingers. Lights go out. He's in nothing but darkness. He calls for the purple smoke and the spotlight and the ambiance. This guy's fucking money, people. This guy is absolutely fucking money. He's running through his takeover performances. Uh, He calls his Chicago match, match of the year. He goes over his match with Cassius Ono. He goes over literally everything that was spotlighted on him at takeover. And he expects... And he promises that come take over Brooklyn, we are going to see the spotlight shine the brightest it has ever shined on the Velveteen Dream. I'm probably figuring that they're going to put him with EC3. That's just my prediction on that. I didn't read the spoilers. I refuse to. Just the way things have lined up with Velveteen Dream, I'm probably going to pair him with EC3. Speaking of EC3, he was on this show and he came across that goon, Kona Reeves. Now, EC3 is asked about his run-in with the Velveteen Dream, so if you guys need any more reason why I think they're going to pair these two at TakeOver Brooklyn, it's the first thing that they mentioned when EC3 was walking backstage at Full Sail University conducting an interview. Fan asks him for a selfie. This fucking geek-looking guy comes up to him and you know asks for a selfie. EC3... Uh, kind of says, uh, oh my God, here we go again. All right, I'll take one for you. And then he's like, don't forget to tag me on Instagram. Then we see some other clown sitting down and he asks EC3 for his latest shirt. EC3 coincidentally had one on him. You know, cheap plug on the WWEshop.com website. Throws it at the guy. He's got a free t-shirt. Then EC3 runs into Kona Reeves, who says his custom suit is is nice. And he's got a sick watch. And that's nice. But that's not the finest. So Kona Reeves is like, well, you got a custom suit. And you got a sick watch. And he's looking over his watch. And he, and he goes over and says, well, that's nice. But it's not the finest. Kona Reeves is there smiling. EC3 doesn't appreciate uh, the sarcasm from Kona Reeves. And goes on to say uh, about Reeves, uh, why don't you just fight me? You know, why don't you just fight me? He's calling his... His chains, you know, bargain basement. Would you get them off eBay? So EC3 says that Reeves would get the top 1% beating of his life. Reeves says he'll fight, but it's too bad because they could have been the finest. 
of friends. So I don't know where that's going. I could certainly see WWE giving EC3 a decent victory over a up-and-comer in Kona Reeves, or WWE could possibly pair Kona Reeves and have him feed off of EC3 and his attitude and his look and his style. I don't know. I'm not big on Kona Reeves just yet, but only time will tell what happens here. I'm going to go the route of EC3 and Kona Reeves in the ring because Kona Reeves is going to need some big match experience. Uh, right now, EC3 has nothing going on for himself outside of a little thing going on with Velveteen Dream. So it might be worth it to just to pair these guys and get a nice match out of them. But then again, on the other hand, you really you don't, if Kona Reeves is somebody that WWE's looking at and they want to build up, you know, a, a loss to EC3, yeah, it's a loss to EC3, and it is EC3, but a loss is not something he should be taking if they're going to build him on, you know, a, a platform like NXT and they want to feature him in front of more eyes. So maybe they do become friends. I don't know. Like I said, only time will tell. But EC3, no doubt about it, is headed for a one-on-one -on -one match with the Velveteen Dream at TakeOver in Brooklyn. Ricochet. Ricochet is backstage with Kathy Kelly. And he's talking about the Undisputed Era and how he has history with that group. Ricochet talks about Adam Cole barely defending. And this is another just seed-planted you know, he mentioned Adam Cole barely defending the North American Championship, and I wouldn't say barely. You know, he's defended it, you know, here and there, but, you know, it, it, to me it makes the title a little bit more valuable if he, he isn't defending it uh, every single week like a television championship. You know, Adam Cole has the North American Championship. I think he's been a fine North American champion. There's nothing wrong with Adam Cole you know, not defending the championship on a, on a random edition of NXT. It's not going to bring any legitimacy uh, down from the championship reign or the championship. This is what TakeOver is for. North American Championship. Now, the only thing I didn't like is that he didn't defend it at uh, the last TakeOver. That, that was something that was bizarre. Uh, I would have put him against somebody, but it didn't fit into the storyline. And WWE with NXT is very storyline-driven. So I really didn't have a problem with it, but I, I would have much rather seen a NXT North American Championship match at TakeOver Chicago. But Ricochet mentions that Adam Cole barely defended his North American Championship since winning it. Ricochet came very close to winning it in that ladder match in New Orleans. Ricochet went on to say that Adam Cole has been hiding behind that title and O'Reilly, Fish, and Strong. And that he won't stop until he becomes the next North American Champion. And then he even imitates uh, Adam Cole doing the boom. So he's predicting that he's going to be the new North American champion. Adam Cole versus Ricochet at TakeOver Brooklyn. Take my money. Could be one of the best matches that we see all year in WWE. And I, again, have predicted that if Ricochet is the new North American champion, Adam Cole undoubtedly is going to be catapulted to the, to the NXT championship. That's just my honest opinion. Adam Cole is a great first North American champion. You want a notable name to win that championship and bring some importance to it. Adam Cole has done just that. But Adam Cole, we all know, is a type of guy that you look at and, and think and see, well, this guy should be the face of the brand. This guy has moneymaker written all over him. So if Adam Cole is not placed in the NXT championship hunt after TakeOver Brooklyn, I would be very shocked. They brought in Ricochet because they believe that this guy has, you know, superstar potential, which he does. Getting him the North American Championship is a great step one. Adam Cole, to me, right now is above the North American Championship. That's a great title for Ricochet. Uh, we could even see a rematch with the Velveteen Dream. We could see matches with EC3. It's going to be some good stuff. But Adam Cole is well above that. I think he is world title material. And I think Adam Cole following Brooklyn is going to be placed in the next tier for the NXT Heavyweight Championship. Um, the main event, like I already told you guys, was a triple threat match. It was Candice LeRae, Nikki Cross, and Kyrie Sane. Uh, Kyrie Sane, we already went over, won the number one contenders match. Uh, LeRae did a vertebraker. She hits that springboard moonsault to follow up, which is beautiful. I love when Candice LeRae does that, man. The height that she gets is just beautiful. Uh, she goes for cover, but Kyrie Sane was already waiting on the top rope for her insane elbow. Uh, so Candice LeRae went to go cover Nikki Cross, and then up top, 
comes Kyrie Sane and drops the elbow right across LeRae's back and neck. Uh, Nikki Cross rolled out of the ring, and then Candice LeRae was pinned 1-2-3, and Kyrie Sane is the new number one contender for the NXT Women's Championship. She will indeed go on to battle Shayna Baszler for the title in Brooklyn. This seemed like a leftover edition of NXT. They didn't have much going into this episode. That's why we got the inside story of the War Raiders. We got a promo from Ricochet. We got a, a promo from Undisputed. Um, I love when <laughs> I love when Adam Cole, actually, during his promo uh, on last night's show, he was like, you guys want to hear a joke? You guys want to hear a joke? Ricochet. I, I, I just LOL, dude. I couldn't stop laughing. I thought that was hilarious. So simple, but so funny. But like I said, I feel like it was a leftover episode of NXT. We got the War Raiders story. We got the promos from Ricochet and Adam Cole. Velveteen Dream did his thing. EC3 did his thing. Um, Cash Asono did his thing. Lacey Evans beat Dakota Kai last night in a match that really wasn't uh, all that great whatsoever. I I felt very bored during this match. I think it went way, way too long. Lacey Evans could not keep my interest at all during that match with Dakota Kai. It was too slow. I don't know why she was trying to wear down Dakota Kai the way she did. Lacey Evans really isn't that entertaining of a female character just yet to have an entire match just full of rest holds and arm bars. You know, so it really didn't do anything for me. Uh, Lacey Evans seems to be another female that they're trying to bring on the up and up, but I- I'm not... She's gotten better. Don't, don't you know, get on me for that. Don't, don't take that the wrong way. She's gotten better, but, you know, she's not like, must-see standout to me yet. So, I'm much more of Team Kick than I am Lacey Evans. That's just me. But, this was, like I said, a leftover edition of NXT. They planted seeds for what's to come. Now, last night, they did the last set of tapings before before Brooklyn. I'm not going to go over anything. I'm not going to go over what WWE uh, app texted us notification-wise. You know, I'm not going to go over that. I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to enjoy what we get next week. It's Champa versus Aleister Black. The one thing that I am interested in is how everything comes to be and how we get the main event for Brooklyn. And I swear on my fucking grandfather, if if WWE does any inkling of what I had predicted, because I have not heard anybody mention anything about what I would do for Gargano, Ciampa, and Black. Now, you guys know I played up the fact that I would like to see a 1997 SummerSlam ordeal with Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, and The Undertaker, you know, and their roles being reprised by Gargano, Champa, and Black. If WWE gives me any indication that it's at least similar to what we've seen in New Jersey at the IZOD Center for the 1997 SummerSlam, I am going to state on this podcast next week, there's no doubt in my mind that somebody from WWE is listening to what I do here. Because I did not hear any other podcast, unless they took it directly from me, I did not hear any other podcast mentioned that scenario for Black, Gargano, and Champa. Just going to throw that out there. I did not read how everything came to be last night. I'm not reading anything of how Brooklyn's going to materialize. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. But if WWE does any inkling of that 1997 SummerSlam next week, There's no doubt in my mind that somebody from WWE, somebody in that company is watching what I do here. Nobody mentioned that. Nobody. We'll see what happens, man. Next week is going to be probably one of the biggest nights in all of WWE for 2018. Black and Champa for the NXT Championship. Uh, Normally, uh, I'm starting to do the TakeOver, you know, review. Not TakeOver, but the NXT reviews the, the next day. Next week, I'm doing, I'm, I, if, unless House of Glory calls me, I may be doing it night of. I'm not sure. It, it's, if House of Glory calls me to do any recording to, uh, next week for my new show on their YouTube channel, we'll, we'll play it by ear. But if I don't, then I will be doing it from that night. And if I have to go to Brooklyn for House of Glory, I'll be doing it immediately the next morning. So just keep an eye out for that. But that's why I've been doing it for these past couple of Thursdays, because... Uh, House of Glory wants me to get more involved and I want to be in Brooklyn for them because they have their biggest show of the year coming up. It is their WrestleMania and I want to be there and help them just achieve the success that they deserve. So that is the reason for that. But thank you guys so much, man. Not really much happened on NXT outside of just a few teasers and a few seeds planted for 
the following weeks to come as we head into Brooklyn for TakeOver. Thank you guys so very much, man. If you missed anything on the channel this week, there's a lot of stuff to catch up on before we hit off the script. Uh, episode 231 next, uh, next time on Friday. Uh, we got Monday Night Raw, we got Extreme Rules, we got off the script, the Shane Douglas interview, and then we did SmackDown. So there's a lot of stuff to catch up on if you guys have missed anything on the channel. Please follow me on Twitter, at JD from NY206. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for notification. We are nearing 95,000 subscribers, man. Thank you guys so much for all your support. Uh, we're doing big things, and it's going to continue on through the rest of the summer, man. Thank you guys so much. Hit that thumbs up, and I'll see you all tomorrow for Off the Script. I'll talk to you later.